Welcome to Primetime, powered from the Sereno Cigar Company studio in North Carolina. It's episode 24 of the Primetime Show. This week, we welcome our special guest, Enrique Cejas of Matilde Cigars. In our Debonair Ideal segment, we'll talk about wedding cigars. And in our Deliberation segment, we will look at what the IPCPR should do when considering a new CEO. This episode of the Primetime Show is brought to you by Saga Cigars, makers of the Saga Golden Age Cigar. The Golden Age is a cigar that takes you back to the classic days of cigar smoking. Through six generations of experience by the Reyes family, the Saga Golden Age delivers a timeless blend that uses the nobility of the tobacco to bring you the perfect balance of power and flavor. It narrates better than words the history of a family's tradition in tobacco delivering a cigar much like the ones they used to use in the times of Hemingway. Saga Golden Age is a full-bodied, full-flavored Dominican Puro. With tobaccos from one farm, the blend features a Corojo 2006 wrapper and filler from the original Caribbean Cuban seeds grown in the Dominican Republic. Available in four sizes at an affordable price, the Saga Golden Age is sure to please and take you back on a journey to yesteryear. And by Drew Estate. Check out and download the Drew Diplomat app for your mobile device. Keep up with everything going on Drew Estate. Experience the subculture that is the rebirth of cigars. Available on iTunes or Google Play. For more information, check out www.drewdiplomat.com. And by Villager Cigars. Since 1888, Villager Cigars have been experts in everything tobacco, including offering a wide range of premium cigars for all connoisseurs. Villager's latest release, La Florida Yin Clan, is a project that has been 10 years in the making. It's a true collaboration between Villager chairman Heinrich Villager and master blender Jose Matias Maragoto. The cigar delivers a full-flavored experience thanks to the extensive aging of the tobacco. Be sure to ask your local retailer for La Florida Yin Clan, and you can visit Villager's entire line of premium cigars at www.villagercigars.com. Welcome, everybody. It's episode 24 of the Primetime Show. Will Cooper, I'm in the Sereno Cigar Company studio uh, here in North Carolina, and I'm joined across the country by Mr. Aaron Loomis. Aaron, how's it going today? I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself, Will? Well, th- this today was like a cake at uh, Walk in the Park compared to yeah. Tuesday. Did you see what happened on Tuesday, show? I heard, I heard uh, you know, Coop website went down, uh, Bear's car went down. Uh, yep. just a, a big a big mess yeah and i yeah so for folks who don't know when cigar coop goes down and this is the first time it's gone down like this hard in a very long time i'm not like the best person to be around <laughs> <laughs> and i imagine. i'm like i am wired right so um i i do have a new it company i gotta give the folks that said cactus and adam stafford uh the guy who works uh supports us it which unbelievable support having to deal with me as well had to be a um a chore but it, but uh yeah so yeah i'm wired and then bear i knew that bear was having car problems that day on tuesday and um because of that i was like so he's he tells me this the second like i, I like i see that cigar coop is down <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. but uh but he made it he actually made it to the show and we got we had a plan b to run it just on on youtube if we had it but obviously we would the chat room would have been different it just would have not had a really good experience so um everything was good and we got enrique you know hooked up right uh live tonight so uh yeah. we're gonna get into this segment so all good there fantastic yeah yeah i'm so, just trying to get through a little, a little bit of a head cold here but uh yeah. baseball playoff season so that's exciting so uh i'll, I'll just deal with the head cold for a, a couple more days hopefully and then uh, get back into it so you're not smoking right now i assume i'm smoking Oh, you're smoking. Uh, yeah, it's the thing about when you smoke cigars and you got a head cold is that it usually kind of cl- opens up your sinuses a little bit, mm-hmm. which is this cigar did exactly that when I lit it up. So I can at least breathe now. So that's good. That's always positive, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you guys who are younger, um, Aaron, you are a newer father. Get ready for rounds of head colds coming into the oh, house. It's trust me, that's, just, that's what's going to happen. Yeah. Last year, it was like every every three weeks, we had something going through the house. So yeah, having and a it, kid at daycare and all that stuff, it just is it breaks it, havoc on it, it. It does, it does. Um, and uh, I mean, it's worth it. Don't get me wrong, having the kid, but but yeah. Then I went through like, when they got older. There was like an immune period where I didn't get a cold for like two years, uh, mm-hmm. and then. When we moved our my day job convention to Vegas, it's it's in February, 
Mm -hmm. Every year there's some a, a sort of a break breakout of some sort of virus, and I had the that's where I caught the flu. I was talking about for the show a couple of years ago. Brutal, brutal. Yeah, it seems like when guys that live on the East Coast go to Vegas or Arizona and kind of come back, they just have a hard time dealing with the, hu the huge humidity shifts. Yeah, I, mean, I think there is something to it. I really do. I think that's like when more we go actually going out to till late when you're in Vegas. Yeah, I could know we could sit drinking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I could do it That's too. What I, I think it is too. Your body definitely uh, goes through some adjustments, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's always anyway, fun, though. Yeah, no, I agree. Anyway, so hopefully, Aaron, you're back and uh, you get back to 100. Um, percent I'll be with Saka tomorrow night, so I'm sure that uh, well, there'll be plenty of booze and uh, cigars flowing. So I don't. How have much far is rest. he from where you are? I'm right sure now. I'll make it good. Uh, tomorrow he'll be in Napa, which is like 20 miles from my house. So it's not a big, okay. yeah, it, it looked like he was some, I, I've been, I, I know California relatively well. So he yeah. was up in the central Valley. It looked like he was coming up that Today way. He was in Merced. So he did a weird route. He went up, he went, he did Southern California first. Right. Then he went up to, all the way up to Sacramento, which is, you know, 60 miles North of me. Yeah. Then he went down to Fremont, which is like 30 miles South of me. And then he went to Merced, which is. In you know, for the Central South. California, yeah, yeah. Like so South he, yeah. The route he got, I don't know, I don't know who books his travel, but they need some help. It's, yeah, no, I agree. <laughs> and he's going back through Texas. Now, now he's got to go all the way back up now to Napa, and then he goes a little further north, and then he's driving to you know down south. I think he's going through Arizona, New Mexico, and uh, Texas. Good grief. Good grief. Anyway, so you have to give us some reports from that for sure. Mm -hmm. That uh, uh, are you going to eat any bugs? No. Uh, no chocolate, no. Like he's got no. some good bugs at these events. That's okay. That's okay. I'll, <laughs> what do you I'll, mean I'll just bugs? watch. Like chocolate covered grasshoppers and shit like that. Yeah. Yeah. Like seriously. Like uh, yeah. I heard those are pretty good. I never tried one before, but I've yeah. uh, heard they're not bad. Next Crunchy. time I see you, I'll, I'll bring you I some. I eat protein too. Yeah, exactly. I'll bring you there some you next go. time I see you. Yeah. <laughs> I'll switch you for some Matildas. There you yeah, go. Right. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> There we go. So, uh, I guess I'll formally uh, introduce our guest. Um, tonight we have Enrique Sejas of Matilde Cigars. And Enrique, welcome. Hey, what's up, guys? Hey, guys. Enrique, welcome to Primetime. Hey, thanks, man. Thanks yeah. for having me. Great no, to talk to you and to Aaron, as always. Always good to be here. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So, you know, um, yeah, we've been actually, so like I said, I know we were talking a little before the show. It was great catching up with you as well. So, um, I guess what I want to do to kind of start this off, Enrique, is kind of go back to the beginning a little. And and you're you're the son of, of a legend, a Jose Sejas. And obviously, when you know being the son of a legend, you particularly in the cigar industry, you obviously grew around grew up around tobacco. So, what would give us an idea of what that was like being younger with that? Well, it was uh, having a big playground in a factory. I mean, when my dad was working with Tabacalera de Garcia, it's a I think it's like 50,000 square feet factory. So on Saturdays, I used to go around and, you know, roller skate in the factory, sleep in the tobacco bales in the cold rooms when it was a little bit too hot. So I was always uh, exposed uh, to tobacco manufacturing and uh, always liked it. It was always fun to see the process manufacturing the tobaccos. Never really interested when I was younger. And I got a little bit more interested uh, I, as I came of age, 16, 17. I uh, started uh, getting more uh, interested in uh, tobacco and cigars. It's definitely a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful process. And uh, having, uh, I would say, the ability or the access to the experience and basically the sheer size of the manufacturing of Tabacalera de Garcia when my dad was working there has uh, well, helped me and, uh, and helped grow the passion that my dad uh, instated in me through that factory. Do you think it was like you mentioned that you were 16 or so? Was it, you just chalked it up to maturity that you finally just, hey, wow, this is really great. I want to get into this. Oh, no, frankly, I mean, since I was a kid, I always uh, liked the cigars and always liked the idea of working with cigars. I remember uh, when we were younger, my dad used to work. Uh, she had the factory once worked 24 7 during the boom. And we always uh, kidded around that uh, when uh, he was older, uh, and he retired, we we're going to set up a small manufacturing facility so he can, instead of working so much, just uh, relax and enjoy and do what he loves, which is uh, blending cigars and playing with cigars and tobacco. 
ended up being that he retired and uh, it was the other way around. Uh, he decided uh, eight months after his retirement that he wanted to set up this uh, Matilde a factory with a family and do a you know family project a legacy and a, let's say a start for for me in the industry as well besides of working with him uh, in Tabacalera and uh, so we started uh, Matilde. So how, how old were you when you smoked your first cigar? I'm assuming that the age restrictions uh, where you guys grow was a little bit different so that it probably doesn't apply to uh, our laws here. You know it was uh I was about 19 when I smoked my first cigar, actually. Uh, but out of the record, my first cigar was smoked when I was about 14 or 15. Mm -hmm. But uh, obviously, my father wasn't aware of it. Oh, okay. I was just curious of uh, what it was. But frankly, I started smoking uh, on and off, 17, 18. And then I really got into smoking cigars when I went to college. Smoked mm -hmm. a little bit more. In the Dominican Republic, it was a little bit different. I mean, frankly, my friends made fun of me because I was young and smoking cigars and it was some more of like an old man stuff. I just liked it and uh, and got more and more into it. And once I came back from college and I knew I wanted to work with cigars, I really got into it and uh, just smoking and trying new stuff from the factory and just trying to play with different things uh, as I was with my father. Enrique, I remember when I first interviewed your father, I was like, I was starstruck, right? Because, and I hadn't never gotten that, because there's everyone who I know who smoked a cigar has probably smoked one of your father's blends. I mean, that's just, you think about it, and that's an amazing thing. There's not a lot of people who can say that. Of those cigars, like, that he made, you know, at, at Tobacco Lair, what were the ones that you kind of really gravitated to? Well, I might say maybe a little bit biased, but uh, one of my favorite cigars from Tabacalera de Garcia was uh, the Seja Signature Cigar. Oh, my goodness. Was that, I love that cigar. It was an absolute amazing cigar. Yeah. I remember it was uh, – shit, I remember the blend like from heart. It was so good. Oh, wow. It was a uh, Equinus Sumatran uh, wrapper, has an allure binder, and it had uh, three types of Dominican, a Peru, and a Nicaraguan uh, filler. Just beautiful, rich cigar, nice, balanced that was actually one of the well, my dad's first signature cigar, and that had his name, the Seja Signature Cigar. Then after that, it came more uh, like the Mio Mexicanas by Jose Sejas and other cigars by Jose Sejas, which is unfortunately one of the reasons we can't use uh, the Sejas in our uh, Matilde or our cigars right now because trademark is already uh, taken. Oh, geez. But besides that, uh, let's see. Um, I smoked a lot of the Monte Cristo Platinum. There were other blends like uh, it was a Vega Fina Sumun in 2008. Vega Fina Sumun was an awesome blend that I liked a lot. And one of the things I used to do a lot was when you have access to a cedar room, which has a lot of cigars and a lot of age cigars and very well organized. One of the things I like to do was going into the cedar room and seeing the inventory. There was always like two or three hundred cigars left from any other batch. Mm -hmm. So I used to try and get a lot of, you know, three, four, five, six years, eight cigars right. from the cedar room. So I used to like play around with different, uh, you know, different blends. But definitely to say a signature was one of my uh, favorite blends. And the Sumun 2008 was also one of my favorite blends. I, 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 uh, I agree. I've had those both. The other one I like was the uh, the Vega Fina, uh, Jose Sayas, 2011. Oh, yeah. It was an awesome cigar, too. Which, I remember I got some of them, and I put them away for like a year. And wow, when they were, when I pulled them out after a year, I, I, I smoked through them all. I wish I had them still. Yeah, definitely. Actually, another cigar that uh, was pretty good was uh, Monte Cristo, New York. That oh, that, I enjoyed that, it a lot. that was like when I was doing Cigar of the Year a few years ago. I was still doing, that was my number two Cigar of the Year that year. Oh, there you go. That See? was that was how good that I think that's the best cigar to this day. I, I love Monte Cristo. That's still my favorite Monte Cristo to date. That's come out of the Monte Cristo brand. I would say it, so. It, I, frankly, I would say so. It's a very uh, good cigar. And I, and I tell like a lot of people who I call like the new age smokers. I say if you have not smoked that New York, you owe it to smoke that cigar because you'll be you're real mm -hmm. surprised. Definitely, it's a great blend. Yeah. So when you were going to school, what what were you studying? What, what what did you think your path was if you hadn't already decided that you were going to get into the the business with your father? Um, I did uh, business management. Okay. So I started in Dominican Republic, 
And uh, two years later, well, actually about a year and a half later, I transferred to New York in Rochester RIT. And I finished my uh, business management uh, degree. I went uh, back to the Dominican Republic and started working with uh, distributors for cigars in the uh, Dominican Republic. So I didn't start directly working with, uh, with well, cigar manufacturing, let's say. Mm-hmm. So I was uh, helping in uh, sales and uh, marketing there. Then I went back and did uh, marketing and project management, which has helped a lot in the, in the Matilde process. Mm-hmm. And then when I was done with that, that's when I actually started working uh, with, uh, with well, the company Altalisa and my father. All right, nice. So kind of your start then um, with doing that marketing piece, how was that um, kind of getting into the, the business at that level? What was the, what was the experience like? Well, it's a, it was a, it's a very different market uh, compared to the United States. The Dominican Republic market, there's a lot of travel retail. I would say about 95% of uh, sales of cigars in Dominican Republic are people that come in traveling. They come to cigar country, you know. Mm-hmm. We're known for cigars, rum, coffee, and beaches. Beaches, not bitches. <laughs> and uh, so we worked a lot with uh, people that... I didn't know a lot about cigars, so it's mostly uh, the travel of the retail and getting people to buy the cigars. It wasn't a tough job at the moment because we were working with the uh, top brands of Dominican Republic, mm-hmm. so it was an easy sell for uh, for them. But I worked a lot with the incentive programs with the stores. I, st- I did a lot of uh, trainings with like two frees and uh, stores brought to the factory. Didn't you know? Did the tour? Explained to them how the manufacturing process was done and all that. So even though I was working in the marketing and sales side, I was always working a little bit uh, in the manufacturing side, or at least showing people about it. Um, but if I would say it, uh, it gave me an insight of what the U.S. market was going to be, I'd be lying. I mean, the U.S. market is a totally different market, as you know. This is a consumer market. People are very passionate about cigars. It's more of a passion, love, and, uh, and people look for more than just a brand. People look for a, a face behind it, a good blend, consistency. And that's things that uh, at the moment I was working in the Dominican market was not there that much. I believe now it's grown a lot. Mm-hmm. The Dominican market has grown a lot in the consumer base. So it's been growing a little bit more. For example, there's a couple of groups here in the Dominican Republic, like Smokers RD, which is a huge group of uh, Dominican smokers are always looking for new things. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, it was a good experience, a good sales and marketing experience, but I had a lot to learn before I got to working with the U.S. market for sure. Mm-hmm. So what was your transition like to the U.S. market then? How did you, you know, you said it's very different. So did you kind of run into some roadblocks as that, as that transition happen? Oh, definitely. There's always roadblocks. I mean, every uh, every startup company doesn't really matter how much experience you have in it. I mean, as a small company, there's always a roadblock. But uh, but definitely, yeah. Initially, we started with our own distribution uh, company. We weren't experienced in distribution. My dad was more experienced in the manufacturing mm-hmm. and uh, blending. So that was a huge roadblock. That's when we started. Uh, well, we decided to work with uh, SAG and Casada. They have a lot of experience in distribution. TJ is a great guy, and the Casada family are great people. So that's what, one of the things that uh, we learned. So instead of doing the logistics and the distribution, we decided to focus more on the all well, the marketing, the blending, and the actual going out and promoting the cigar. Then besides that, uh, getting the cigar into the store wasn't really hard. As you were saying, uh, people, a lot of people know my dad. They knew the blend. They know it was a good blend. But getting it, uh, getting people to know the cigars, the smoker to know the cigars, it took us a little bit of time to actually get to know it. I think another thing that, uh, in retrospect, we would have done differently was instead of coming out, when we started the line, uh, the idea behind Matilda was uh, keeping it simple. It was creating as what we have right now is four core blends with uh, four different sizes. We wanted to keep with the core sizes, which is your Corona, Robusto, Toro, and Grande at the time. And if you'll see from our portfolio, all our core lines have those sizes, with the exception of the Quadrata, that has Robusto, Toro, and Torpedo. Mm -hmm. When we started out, the idea was coming out with one blend every year, and the other year coming out with that other blend until we came out with the four blends that we have now. 
the thing with the first year was when you have, although it's a new brand with an old name, it's still a new brand in the retail side. And uh, we came out with one line, four sizes for a year and a half. And I believe uh, it sometimes it got lost in the humidor. Shit, I used to go into the humidor looking for my cigars and sometimes I couldn't find it. So frankly, if something that I learned that would have been in retrospect, instead of coming out with only one line, coming out with two lines, having your Habano and your Maduros together at the same time. So you have a little bit different uh, profiles for different people. You also have a little bit more exposure. Instead of having, you know, 12 inches, you have uh, 24, 36 inches, right. which is uh, what you're looking for. Yeah. That didn't happen when we were in the DR because it was just a basically totally different market. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you always have roadblocks, but we've been solving them. or we've solved them, actually. And, uh, and now we're here with our four lines. 15 SKUs, nice portfolio of cigars. You took a kind of an interesting route to where you are now, though, because a lot of companies will start out, um, they'll contract out with a factory, and they'll, you know, obviously strike a distribution agreement. You guys actually started the opposite way. You started with a very, I'd say, small vertical operation. But the way I kind of read it is for your gross it was necessary for you to change that model. Would you say that's accurate? Can you repeat that? You cut off. Oh, okay. Um, so I was saying that um, you guys took a very different approach than a lot of companies as far as um, gross. In terms of, I see a lot of companies start out with contracting at a factory to make the cigar and then striking a distribution agreement. And then eventually growing maybe to have their own sales force and then to have their own factory. You guys took the opposite approach. You had a very small vertically integrated operation. And I think the way I read it is for the necessity of your growth, you kind of went the opposite way. Would you say that's accurate? Yeah, it would be correct. That would be correct. Este, frankly, when we started the manufacturing facility, it was, it was, a, it was a no-brainer at that time. Este, my dad came from manufacturing. He managed the largest uh, cigar factory in the world. So we had a lot of access to tobacco. We had a lot of access to well, knowledge and employees. So manufacturing cigars wasn't a problem. When it came uh, to a point of Berto working with Hochi and Tabacalera Palma, was simple as tobacco, good manufacturing. As somebody that we came along and uh, had very same little mindsets that we did, but when you have a small company in a smaller manufacturing facility even though you have access to a lot of very good tobacco, it's a lot harder to get a lot of good tobacco that is already aged. That's what we need to make good blends to keep the cigars consistent year after year. So when we moved to Hochi, we moved to a factory that's been working since 1936. It has at least three years of tobacco for manufacturing and has a lot of inventory of different types of tobacco. So for uh, the growth of manufacturing to have more flexibility in blending, more flexibility in basically manufacturing, uh, that's the reason we went to working with, uh, with Hochi. It has a lot of tobacco. It's one of the largest tobacco growers in the country, private tobacco growers in the country. And it allowed us to work with different blends at the same time. When we were working with our smaller company, let's say we wanted to make the Oscura, it took you a lot more time because we had to go out and source the tobacco before we worked with it. So it was just little by little, we said, okay, man, it makes a lot more sense to uh, start manufacturing with somebody that has more tobacco, more AIDS tobacco. It'll keep our cigars more consistent and will give us a lot more flexibility to do it. it the, the transition, in my opinion, has been seamless because these blends smoke, and I smoke a lot of, I smoke all four lines. And they smoke exactly as they've been since they've been inception. So what, you know, how did you do it? That was just, that, that, that was just amazing. I think, you know, to keep that, that level of consistency moving the factory. Well, I, I think it's, uh, there's different factors. I mean, it's first of all, uh, having a good partner, which is a great partner. He has a great mentality and we share. It's also, when I say partner instead of a supplier, because he is a partner, like when we started uh, manufacturing with Hochi, I moved to Santiago. I've been living here for two, two and a half years now since like the day we moved to production, I moved to Santiago. I actually lived in a, I, we have a small cabin about 45 minutes away and I thought I'd give it a try to live in 
<laughs> in the mountains. That shit didn't work. Um, so I moved to, uh, to the city afterwards. But I would say having a great partner, uh, having the access of the tobacco. I mean, a lot of tobaccos that we used, uh, Hochi had already. He's been using it before. Like uh, all our blends have uh, different uh, uh, core blends, so different filler blends. And out of all the blends, the only tobacco that we use, which is the same, is uh, Dominican Piloto. And uh, it was a tobacco that Hochi used a lot and liked a lot too. And he also used that same uh, tobacco from our same supplier that we had. So having the right tobacco, having the correct uh, partner always helps to keep that blank assistant. And I think it's uh, it's very important. Sometimes you uh, choose a wrong partner and you can have a perfect blend. And if you know the culture and the manufacturing in the factory is not correct, if the tobacco is not correct, you're gonna end up with, you know, a blend all over the place. Sometimes it's going to be good. Sometimes it's going to be bad. But uh, with us, we've had, uh, I wouldn't say luck because, you know, but it's been working uh, perfectly fine. So, yeah, I would agree. Just on the geography thing for a second, because you mentioned you moved up from La Romana to Santiago. How, that's a pretty far trip, right? It's not like you moved a half hour away, right? Because, I mean, I, I went to the DR for the first time this year, and I, I didn't realize how big it is. How many hours yeah. is it apart? Mm, like four and a half hours away. Okay. So that's it's like kind of far. Hour. Yeah, it is pretty far. It is pretty far. Yeah, at the end of the game, it's one country. I can, you can, the beautiful thing about our country, the infrastructure is great and you can move around the country in less than eight hours anywhere. But it's a pretty, uh, it's, it's a big stretch. Big. It's not a small island is what I'm kind of getting at. Oh, no, no, not at all. It's not a small island at all. But, uh, but yeah, it was a good move. I like it. I actually like Santiago a lot. It's a uh, beautiful city. It's a beautiful city. Nice people. Got tobacco all over the place. This is good. And, uh, and I have the Jarabacoa, a small cabin over there. And at the end of the game, I mean, it's a great place to be at. Good people. You know, when you said cabin, right? I, I went up into the Camp David area. Which um, Is that kind of where you are near there? Because there's some high mountains there. I didn't realize how high the mountains go up there. No, we're actually about 45 minutes out of Santiago. It's mm -hmm. out of a little bit more in the center. Este, our cabin is uh, like literally uh, out of the city, like like I would say in the mountain. So when I moved there, I had very little access to internet. Uh, anytime I wanted to go out, I had to drive about 45 minutes away. So uh, it's like in the mountain. It's not uh, like in the city or in the vicinity of the city. It's about 45 minutes away from uh, Santiago going up into Jarabacoa. Yeah, I mean, like I said, when I went up to Camp David, it, it, you know, I think of, you know, you think of the Caribbean, you have a certain image. But when you go up into the mountains there, it's, it's the mountains. I was like, you were up in a mountain there. It was really kind of cool almost. Yeah, we actually have the Pico Duarte's uh, in the Dominican Republic. It's... Uh, one of the the largest uh, mountain in the Caribbean, if I'm not mistaken, it's three thousand eight hundred square meters. Uh, meters, I believe. It's pretty, pretty, pretty tall. Nice, nice. But yeah, we do have mountains. We do have mountains. Uh, mountains, beaches, cities, a little bit of everything. I would say Camp David is a great place, isn't it? Oh my goodness! <laughs> oh my goodness! I, 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 I'm thinking vacation. Yeah, I know. I actually, I when know. I came back, I told my wife. I said we have to go there. Yeah, it's a great uh, place. It really well, maybe is. when you're back, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll invite you to the cabin. We'll have a uh, spend a day there. It's a uh, very, I'll very take peaceful up on that. Yeah. place to smoke a cigar and have a cup of coffee in the morning. Yeah. Beautiful. It's great. Oh, I look forward to it. We're yeah. talking with Enrique Sejas of Matilde Cigars. This is Will Cooper and Aaron Loomis for episode 24 of the Primetime Show. Aaron, I'll turn it back over to you. So you kind of talked about your transition to uh, working with Hochi at Tobacco La Palma. How was the how was the transition to uh, Quesada for distribution working with them? Uh, it was seamless. Um, Quesada, we've known for a long time. My dad's known uh, Manuel and the family for a long time. I've known also for a long time. TJ, I just uh, met at the moment, but it was a seamless move. Uh, we used the same brokers. Almost all of our brokers were the same. So retail side, it was very seamless. And uh, and it's been a great move. I mean, they have a bigger arm. They have a lot more experience in logistics and the customer service in the U.S. market. So for us, it gave us uh, a bigger umbrella, let's say, of customers. And it also gave us the ability to focus more on the manufacturing, on the blending. And for me, 
in the actual traveling and the promoting uh, the cigars. I was before we came onto the show. I was telling uh, Coop that uh, I just came back from Germany and we were in the Inter de Bac and then did a small tour in uh, in Berlin area. And that's something that if we were running a distribution and we were running all the manufacturing, and if we did not trust our distributors and our manufacturers, we couldn't do because we had to be on top of it at all times. With uh, these two partners, we we're able to do that. We we're able to focus on the quality of the cigars and the manufacturing and the blending and the actual going out and promoting our brand. Yeah, it's it seemed like um, I mean I was at the booth this year. Spent some time at the booth. You guys were it was tight. It was great. I mean I've been at the you guys have been there for three years I think at the booth now. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean so you guys you, you guys fit right in is what I've noticed. Oh yeah, it's definitely it's a good relationship. I mean I've known uh, all the Casals for a long time. Raquel and Pachi, Ostos and TJ. Now I know him for you know for a long time now. Don Manolo and Sandra. So yeah, it's seamless. I mean it's been uh, it's been a very good experience, very good ride. So you, you've kind of through this transition. You, you, this the, it started as a family venture, but now you've become the face of the company. Yep, that's uh, was that by design. Well, it's uh, it happens. It happens. Yeah. Yes. Right. My brother started uh, with us in the manufacturing facility. He, had, he helped us uh, settle the manufacturing side on it while I was doing the sales and the marketing. Mm -hmm. And uh, once we moved our manufacturing to Ho Chi, he was a diplomat initially. So he he was he'd been in the French embassy for about seven years before he, we started Matilde. So after we moved our transition to Ho Chi, he went back to being a diplomat. He's now a uh, first secretary in uh, Holland. Mm -hmm. And uh, when it comes to my father, he was already retired. It was something that it was a project of passion for him. He wanted to make the best cigar in the world and best manufactured cigar in the world. But it was uh, it was his retirement. I don't know if you know, my dad has Parkinson's. So it also, he takes a little bit, uh, takes a little bit of a toll on him. So right. little by little, I've been taking a little bit more and more and more function to a point where I have tried to become I'm never going to be the face of the company because that's my father, but try to be the person that promotes and travels uh, promoting our brand simply because it's just a lot for my father to do at this moment. Understood. So he basically uh, focuses a lot on the uh, blending and making sure the blends are correct. And as I say, cracking the whip. So he tells me <laughs> so what he's to still, do. He's still very active. Yeah, he sits down on the factory floor is what you're telling me. He's uh he's not at the factory floor at all times. He makes sure the blends are correct. He uh he smokes all the cigars and he'll come into Santiago at least uh once every 15 days. So that's what he does. I mean, after living in La Romana all your life and retiring in La Romana, making a move like picking everything up and going to Santiago wasn't an option for him. So right. I did it. And that's uh right. I'm his eyes, I'm his ears, everything here while he's not here. But he's still cracking the whips. I can tell you that. <laughs> was he involved in like I, he was involved with all the blends? Yes. Okay. Yes. My father is uh, fully involved in all the blends. Okay. I was actually uh, I worked with him on all the blends, and I've been a little bit more active in the past two blends, which were the Quadrata and the Serena. Mm -hmm. But uh, learning from him has been a uh, interesting. Uh, thing i mean when when you have as much experience as my dad had in blending sometimes you tell them you know we did this this and this we blended these tobaccos together and sometimes he'll tell me oh no that's not gonna work because x y and z i mean he's maybe he's tried it before maybe he knows that tobacco doesn't work with it, with another tobacco so uh when i started uh, playing around with blends initially i told them what it was from the beginning and sometimes I know like, that's not going to work. Do something else or, you know, try this and this and this. So what I started doing was, uh, let's say I started playing with a blend. I, and I told him, Dad, smoke this. He's like, what is it? Ah, well, I'm not going to tell you what it is. You smoke it and then you let me know what you think. And then after he smoked and he tried it, he said, okay, I think this and this and this and this. And then he would tell me, what did you put in? After I did that, he would tell me, okay, let's change this. Let's move this around to make a uh, blend better. But uh, yeah, he's active in all the blends. He's active in the actual tasting and making sure all our all our productions are correct. 
And uh, little by little, I've been learning and uh, being more active in the blending side of uh, the business. What do you prefer to, what side of the business do you prefer? The, what I would say, being on the blending factory end of it, production, or the road warrior out at the shops? Well, blending and manufacturing is awesome. I love it. Uh, frankly, it's uh, it's what I grew doing, or I grew looking at my dad doing. And it's something that uh, that I like a lot. So I really like that part of it. Uh, but then there's a social aspect of being the road warrior. It uh, it's a lot of work, but getting to meet guys like you, you know, consumers at the stores or even retailers, it's also a lot of fun. If you would tell me. If I had to choose one or the other, I would say I'd be blending and manufacturing because I really like to play and experiment a lot with uh, tobaccos and I'm always interested in trying new stuff. But if I could do both, I'd do both. And that's what I've been doing uh, for the moment. A lot of fun on both ends, though. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. a lot of fun. I mean, it's, yeah, of fun. I, it's hard work. I mean, I, I, I do, I've cut my travel down on my day job the last few years a bit. Um, and that's just, that wasn't, but I had an opportunity to do that, but I can tell you it's rough being on the road. So yeah, it's tough. I was just telling you, I, I'm still, uh, working on my jet lag from Germany. I've been waking up like four, four thirty in the morning every day for the past, well, not every day for the past two days. Hopefully tomorrow I wake up about six and then, you know, Saturday or Sunday I'll wake up about seven, but yeah, it takes a toll. It's a lot. And when you come back uh, to the office, there's a lot to do. But, you know, it's, uh, it's a fun industry, and it's, uh, even though it's tough, it's still enjoyable. And frankly, if you don't enjoy being a road warrior, it's, it's really tough. So you got to enjoy what you, what you do, being a road warrior. Well, you know it. If you don't like to travel, you don't like to socialize with people, you're pretty much screwed. Yeah. I mean, actually, it was kind of interesting because when I was building what I'm doing, and, and it's still got a long way to go. But I actually, when I was traveling, I, you know, at night, um, I had, you know, nothing to do sometimes. So I just, I, that's, I started going to different cigar shops in different cities I traveled in and I lucked out. I got to meet a lot of people on the way doing that. So it was kind of a little bit by design. I was able to meet, kind of meet people at a much quicker rate than if I was solely in North Carolina, just because it just worked out like that. So I kind of get it too, but it was, there were, there were times I longed to be home as well. Oh, definitely. But as you, that's a, a good uh, point that you mentioned about uh, when you were traveling and you met a lot of people through the cigar shops. And I think that's something that I mentioned, getting to know the cigar smokers that are passionate about smoking and smoking cigars. I think at the end of the game, uh, when you're in a cigar shop, you know, everybody's got their walls down. It's a good time. Granted, there's always an asshole in the cigar shop, but people ignore him. Right. But uh, it's a... Uh, it's a it's a big brotherhood. I think it's one of the only uh, industries where you can actually walk into a store and not know anybody and uh, leave knowing at least one, two, or three people that were smoking a cigar. It's as simple as what are you smoking? Yeah. yeah. It's exactly. Yeah, yeah, and you experienced it firsthand. I mean, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a brand owner, so I experienced it on, other, on another side, which still, uh, still relates to it, but you experienced it on the actual uh, traveling side. Yeah, and I bet you made a lot of your friends uh, smoking cigars in a cigar shop. Uh, very, very true. I mean, it's very yeah. true. Um, like I said, there were a lot of brands I got exposed to as well, which I just wouldn't have, because a lot of brands are still very much regional in this country. So mm -hmm. there were brands I got exposed to that maybe weren't in the southeast, but were in the northeast or the Midwest. Um, it just worked out like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a beautiful industry, my friend. It's a beautiful industry. So you want to start talking about the lines? Yep. Cool. Yep. Let's do that. So Enrique, can you kind of take us through the, the first line that you guys introduced? Well, our first line was uh, Matilde Renacer. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, Matilde first. Okay. Matilde is actually a uh, old brand. It was founded in 1976 by Michael Simeon Messias in Santiago. When uh, we started uh, the company was, I mentioned before, we couldn't use our last name because uh, my dad uh, passed it over to Altadis for the Seja signature. So instead of creating a brand from scratch, we wanted to uh, well pay homage to the country. And the way that we did what, that was having a historian looking at different brands that were uh, in the Dominican Republic that were not there anymore, so dead brands. And we came along to uh, Matilde, and that's how our brand originated. The logo is a, the logo, our logo is an S with a Matilde in the middle, which is a, 
lady in the middle. The original logo for Matilde was an S and an M for Simeon Mencia. It was called La Matilde de Simeon Mencia. So I wanted to say that before we started talking about our first blend, because our first blend is called Renacer. Renacer means rebirth. And we thought it was a suitable name for that same reason. It's a rebirth of this brand and also what I like to call the rebirth of uh, my father. He was this man that uh, worked all his life in corporate, started his job in 1974 and retired from that same, uh, well, same company at the end of 2011 and came from managing 5,000 employees, making anywhere between you know, 20 and 50 million cigars to managing 25 employees and making 150, 200,000 cigars. So it was a rebirth on both sides, on my dad's side and also on this brand. So the initial idea on our uh, Matilde Renace was creating a all day around cigar. It's a cigar that's very noble to the palate, balanced. It's got a lot of flavor. So it's a cigar you can smoke in the morning because it's not overpowering, but it has enough flavor you can smoke after you know a stronger cigar or after a big meal with a big drink, let's say. It's a Bano Ecuadorian wrapper, has a Dominican binder, has three types of Dominican filler and uh, one Nicaraguan. Uh, that cigar comes in uh, four different sizes. It has a Corona, a Robusto, a Toro, and a Grande. And we actually had a limited edition Lancero. Oh, we I love did, that cigar. Uh, it wasn't a great, it was an amazing. I think I still have a box. I have one box left of uh, that blend. We had 25,000 cigars made. Uh, it was 40, 40, 40. 40 ring gauge, 40 box count for my dad's 40th in the industry. Where is it? Somewhere around there. I, just, I know I still have a box. I'm not going to smoke it anytime soon, though. <laughs> I'll Anyways. save a little story on that for the second segment when we talk about the wedding cigars. That played in a little bit, so I'll, I'll, hold, okay. I'll hold off on that. Yeah, but yeah, that's a great cigar. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, our second line, which was uh, Matilde Oscura with uh, Aaron's smoking, the idea behind uh, this cigar was having your Maduro. Uh, you have your Mexican San Andrean wrapper. You have an Ecuadorian Sumatran binder, and you have Dominican Nicaraguan and Pennsylvania filler. Uh, the Pennsylvania filler gives it a lot of the strength and nice sweetness to it. And then we round that up with uh, the Dominican and the Nicaraguan to make it a more balanced smoke. Correct me if I'm wrong, Aaron. It starts with a nice little pepper and then I'll smooth it out to being a lot more natural sweetness, a very creamy cocoa cigar. Yep. It's uh, medium plus embodied. You won't really feel it aggressive to the palate. It's more of a balance and you'll feel the strength building up as you smoke it. Same thing. It comes in four different sizes. Corona, Robusto, Toro, and Grande. One of the things that uh, we did when we were developing this uh, line or this brand was we tried to keep it simple. We wanted to do different core blends at the same core sizes. It was easy for the retailers. It was easy for the consumers and uh, accessible uh, to the eyes. All our lines have the same type of packaging. It's cabinet boxes. It's the same branding. What changes is the color. Renacer is a brown band. Oscura is a green band. What uh, Coop is smoking is a Matilde Cuadrata. This is actually our third uh, line, medium plus bodied, uh, different profile. It's got a lot more uh, spices, it's rich tobacco flavors, very lingering in the palate. This is an H2000 seed from Ecuador, so another Habano Ecuadorian wrapper. It has an Allure binder, which is about five years old. Remember I was talking about uh, her uh, factory with a lot of aged tobacco. We came along this beautiful Olor binder in uh, Hochi's factory, which he hasn't used. It was there for about five years. He was uh, storing it, and we started using it with uh, Matilde Cuadrata. And once again, it has three types of uh, Dominican and one Nicaraguan. You'll notice a trend between all our blends. It always has Dominican and Nicaraguan. Uh, my dad's always loved the combination. He believes it's like salt and pepper. So all our blends have at least 60% Dominican and then a combination between Nicaraguan and, and the Oscura has a little bit of Pennsylvanian. And our uh, last smoke is what I'm smoking, which is your Matilde Serena. I think every company should have a, a mild smoke. It's a mild to medium. It does not add a lot of hype, let's say, to uh, the company, but it's a big segment in the market. I would say a lot of sales are mild to medium smokes. With uh, this cigar, was creating a cigar that was mild enough for those uh, for beginners, for mild smokers, but had enough character and flavor for somebody, well, like any of us, 
or uh, you know medium medium plus bodied smokers to still enjoy as a morning cigar as a nightcap like for this cigar I love it for a nightcap because it's a very clean cigar so it gives me flavor but it won't leave me with that deep tobacco flavors in the mouth before I go to sleep same thing in the morning it's not super strong it's a mild to medium but it still has flavor to it and that's what we were looking for with this cigar it was creating this cigar that had a big range of smokers beginners mild smokers but also a good cigar for a medium medium plus smoker body smoker when they're looking for something uh well milder still has character still has flavor this would be a very creamy cigar a uh, nice flavors to it not overly sweet but just very creamy and rich in flavor this is a ecuadorian connecticut the wrapper has a dominican binder and has dominican and nicaraguan filler i don't know if i mentioned it at at the show, I believe I did, is that the, the only tobacco that we use in all the lines that are the same is a Dominican Piloto, which uh, my dad's been using for ages, and it's his uh, favorite uh, type of tobacco in the Dominican Republic. And it's the only tobacco that all our cigars share. Then the rest of the tobaccos are different. Because what we wanted to do was creating uh, four core blends with different profiles, so we can hit uh, different palettes. So anybody that wants to smoke a cigar can pick up a Matilde and enjoy it. Nice. You know, it makes a lot of sense that we get you going to Hochi's factory. I mean, to me, Piloto Cubano is just something I think synonymous with Hochi Blanco. So yeah. it made a lot of sense. And like you said, if you were getting the tobacco from the same person, it was a natural fit there. Definitely, definitely. It was perfect, I mean, I tell you. And uh, people ask me all the time and everything, you know, and manufacturing and the control. I mean, frankly, I, uh, I wake up every day and I, uh, I come into the factory. I share manufacturing. I sit down with Hochi. It's like being part of the factory. Even though he's a, a supplier, let's say he's more of a supplier. He's, as I said, he's more of a partner. You can come in, see the manufacturing, show what everything's going on. And as you said, he's synonymous with Piloto Cubano. He has... Uh, he has I believe it's four or five different farms, about 6,000 hectares of tobaccos in Acagua, in Canela, Potrero, in Mao. I mean, he's got tobacco everywhere. So Dominican tobacco, he's synonymous with it. We love it. We use it in all our cigars. We make our cigars in the Dominican Republic, so it was a great fit. It was an amazing fit with ours. Nice. So a little story about the Serena is last year I turned 40, so I had a bunch of buddies. Congratulations. Thank you. I had a bunch I of buddies. 50. By the way, I turned 50 this year, so he's the yeah, young guy. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> maybe, maybe you'll do something similar than what, I, what I'm going to tell you about. Okay. So, <laughs> all, the, all the buddies I had over, they all smoke cigars. Some of them are, um, you know, they don't smoke as frequently as some of the others. So they're, you know, occasional smokers, but they're they're more mild, you know, mild type smokers. So they'll smoke a lot of Connecticut stuff, you know, CAO, CAO Golds and things like that. But I, when I smoked this, this, um, Serena, it was an amazing cigar. And what I did was for my birthday is I, I bought a bunch of these cigars just for this party because I knew that the people that smoked a lot and the people that didn't smoke a lot and preferred that mild profile would really dig this cigar. And everybody loved it, loved it. Um, I mean, I would, I would pretty much challenge anybody that says that they don't like Connecticut's to smoke that. And even people that that do like Connecticut's to smoke this because I think that what if you like if you like Connecticut's this will this may turn out to be one of your favorite Connecticut's and if you say you don't like Connecticut's this might be the one cigar that you say you know what maybe I maybe I do like Connecticut's maybe I just didn't find haven't found the right one yet I mean you it, know it just really blew me away so we hit the bullseye right exactly good. Good. Yeah. So I think that's a challenge everybody should take. Everybody listening uh, to the show, find a Serena, give it a try. Whatever you smoke, if you're a medium body smoker, medium plus body smoker, mild smoker, give it a try and uh, let us know what you think. I mean, you can tag us at uh, our Instagram or our Facebook, and uh, we'd love to get your feedback. But I, I would agree with Aaron. I uh, That's what I do all the time. I love it because it's an all-time, uh, all-over cigar, let's say, as you were saying. It's a good palate for everybody. Mm -hmm. So go try it. Yeah, and I'll add my Serena story in um, because it kind of relates to this. A little different story, but I, I told Enrique this right before the show. I had come back from Cuba last August, and um, when I landed back in Cuba, I spent a few days in South Florida. 
And I went right up to uh, Palm Beach and I went into Smoke Inn like the next morning. Mm -hmm. um, and they happened to have the kind of the early release before the FDA on the shelves there. That's, that's and why I, I bought mine I from Smoke Inn. Yeah. And um, I guess it had just got announced in Cigar Aficionado while I was in Cuba. So I was completely shocked by this cigar because you guys didn't have it at the trade show, mm -hmm. at least from what I had saw. You, if you did, no, I didn't. Have it in you didn't. Yeah. So I was. No, we didn't. You, you didn't. Yeah. So I was surprised by it. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of smokers there who are, I'd say, like Aaron was, you know, saying, these are guys who probably aren't Connecticut smokers, and they were smoking that. Um, and I smoked it on a pallet that was probably shot from smoking so much in Cuba. And it was fantastic. I mean, fantastic. I mean, on a shot pallet, I'm getting all that stuff out of there. Even better when I got back and had some on a clean pallet. So I, I agree. Well, wait till you try this on Seto. I'll send you some. You'll yeah. love it. Yeah, and like like what was saying, it was, seemed like more of like of an under the radar release because I think the 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 way I learned about it was just kind of browsing around the smoke in sight. So did yeah, it, well, it seem like your regular release kind of process? It wasn't a regular release initially. What we did was uh, we had uh, our top ten stores carrying it initially for the from July to well for that year, and then we started releasing uh, little by little at different shops. When I started traveling in the states uh, in January, so it was actually a full release, let's say in January, but it wasn't like a full blown release. We just started incrementally increasing stars that were carrying it little by little, and now uh, a lot of our, I think most of our retailers carry it at the moment, and they've been doing awesome with it because, as you were saying, it's just an all around cigar. It's 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 great when you come across a cigar that just like yeah. It stands kind of far away from the other cigars that you you know that you're smoking. You're, Will and I are smoking a lot of cigars that are new every year. You know that's what we're kind of our typical smoking routine is. But when you come across one, then you're just like, all right, this is this is different than the other stuff I've already been smoking this year. Like I you know I really have to take note on this one. It was it, it was just a great experience. I appreciate that. That's something we tried to do with uh with all our blends. Actually, we're trying to make them as unique as possible. It's uh, one of the things that. Uh, I mean, if you tell me to compare one of our uh, blends with something else, I wouldn't be able to pinpoint it. Maybe you can. You've been smoking a lot more cigars than I have, but uh, but we try to make it as unique as possible. Uh, we always try to go to the strength wise and then make it as unique as possible when the profile wise and the flavor wise, just to stand out a little bit as a small company. That's what we try to do. Great cigars, consistent, and uh, just stand out when taste profiles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, even the Quadrata, too. Uh, we'll talk about that in a few minutes, what we're smoking. But, um, yeah, there's just – they're they're not cookie-cutter blends is what I'll just tell people if you haven't smoked these. I see a few folks in the chat room haven't smoked them yet, and they want to. So, yeah, they're, they're not cookie-cutter blends by any – all 40s are very unique. Mm -hmm. yeah, appreciate that, man. Appreciate it. I think we're doing a good job. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> You know, we were t I guess we were talking a little before the show too, and you know, for, for, so for Aaron and I do. We we lo we love the what's new stuff, and we would love to see you every year come out with something new. I mean, because that's just what we do. But at the same time, I look at what you've done with these four releases, and there's a lot of times I'm going into a cigar store, and what I want to do is I don't want to review a cigar. I want to sit and enjoy it, and. I constantly, I'm not just saying because you're on the show, I, these are cigars I will reach for because I know these are consistent blends. I know these are blends that are unique, and I know I'm going to get a great experience out of them. So that's something that I like that you're putting so much effort into that because of the consistency that I've seen out of these cigars. I appreciate it, man. Yeah. Consistency and quality, that's the key. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Having that cigar, you, you can never have a cigar taste the same after each other. But that cigar has to remind you of that other cigar you smoke every day. So yep. once you smoke an Oscura, the next cigar is going to remind you of that. That's something my dad taught me. You can't have them. I mean, it's handmade. It's a natural product. You can't really say, okay, I'm going to do two grams, two grams, and two grams. But they have to have the same profile, same strength uh, profile, same flavor profile in all your cigars. And that's what we try to do. Keep them consistent and keep the quality uh, always at point. So talking about the kind of the what's new type of uh, discussion, um, I think you mentioned a little earlier that there, you know, you might there might be some things that you might come out with uh, in the future that you're 
kind of working on. Is there anything that you can share at all in regards to that? Well, at the moment, we are only uh, we're focusing a lot on our core lines. Mm -hmm. We, as you're mentioning about the wedding cigar. Well, we can talk about the wedding the wedding cigar in a, in a few minutes, but you possibly that they they though something from that kind of a line might make it out later on if there's some flexibility in what the FDA is doing. Yeah, it may be possible. One of the things that we've uh, our what we wanted to do with the lines was coming out with our four core blends and focus on those core blends at all times. I mean, those are the Serena. The Renacer, the Oscura, and the Cuadrata are our lines and the lines that we want to keep in the retailers. Then in the future, coming out with different uh, types of blends as limited editions, just as just small runs coming out with those in small runs, but focusing a lot on our core lines. But I think one of the things that uh, you need to do, companies, focus your resources and uh, focus uh, your experience in uh, what we have. And uh, we believe that, as we were talking about, we have four core blends that just hit about every taste profile there is. So yes, in the future we might be coming if there's flexibility in the future with uh, different lines, extensions, or limited editions. Mm. Let's say we were talking about uh, my wedding cigar, which it's the Oscura with a different wrapper. Just makes it a little bit less earthy, a sweeter cigar, and just uh, let's say smoother smoke, uh, more balanced and uh, more sweetness to it, a little bit stronger. And that's something that I love. I've been smoking for a while, and that's the reason it's going to be one of our uh, my wedding cigar. And it may be something that might be coming out uh, in the future if it's possible. Mm -hmm. If not, we're very happy with what we have, and we we've always had the idea of focusing in these blends. I think if you create our blends, you trust your cigars and your lines, you have to push them. Instead of coming out with something new every year, you push those cigars and it's a more organic growth. It's a slower growth, but I think at the end it works out better. Right. I agree. I agree. Anything else we want to do for this segment or move into the next segment, Aaron? Yeah, let's go ahead and go to the next one. All right, so what we're going to do is we'll talk about the Matilde cigars that we are smoking, uh, Aaron and I, and get uh, talk about with Enrique. And this segment is sponsored by The Cigar Shop. The Cigar Shop for the best and premium handmade cigars. Visit their locations in Monroe, North Carolina, and now South Carolina's largest walk-in humidor in Myrtle Beach. You can visit them on the web at www.cigarshop.com. Be sure to check out their exclusive Casada offering, the Casada Oktoberfest Bayern. And also be sure to sign up at the website to keep up to date on what's new at the store. And you can also find Matilde cigars at both locations. So, okay. Aaron, I guess, uh, yep, they have, they have them at both locations. Because I know because I smoke <laughs> them at both locations. So, um, so uh, anyway, we're moving into uh, what, what we're smoking. So, Aaron, since you're smoking, I guess, the second release, I guess we'll go with you first with the Matilde Oscura. Yeah, I'm smoking the Oscura Grande. So it's a 6x60. Um, and like Enrique was saying earlier, it's it's exactly the profile he described. You get a kind of a punch of pepper and some baking spice right, kind of right off the start. Um, it was I, I appreciate that tonight because it cleared my sinuses up right away, which is good. Um, but as you get a little further in, um, that kind of baking spice fades out and you get kind of a lingering uh, black pepper with a lot of woody notes and earthiness in there. Um, and that kind of carries through the cigar and it's, it's got a nice strength to it. Um, so, you know, you're, you know, you're smoking a, a fuller bodied cigar there. Um, but the, the flavor keeps up with that strength it's the whole time. So it's not like you're just, you know, you're losing the flavor profile and you're just getting a, a, a nicotine hit the rest of the way. It's, they match up really well. It's a good balance there. So um, this is the first time I smoked the Grande. Um, cause I, I wanted a cigar that was gonna last me through the whole show. And this one is, I'm probably at the halfway point now. So it's, it's doing really well. Um, burning fantastic, perfect draw the consistency is there with all the Matilda cigars I smoke. So, um, I'm really enjoying this one. That was my favorite size actually of the, of the, of that line. And this was a, a later release in the three, the three previous Matolas. Is that correct? This one came out in the, around the trade show in 2016. 
Yes, it was. Yes, All it right. was. We initially came out with uh, Corona, Robusto, and Toro Bravo, and then we came out with the Grande. Oh, I'm, I'm confused. I'm, I'm mixing myself up. It was the Toro Bravo. I have not smoked the Grande. Yeah, yeah I admit I haven't. No, the Toro Bravo was your favorite. Uh, yeah, it was the Toro Bravo. Yeah. Favorite. Okay. And what's the what's the size on that Grande? Six by sixty. It it's is a six uh, by sixty. Okay. Yeah, by six. Okay. The Toro Bravo is a fifty-four by six and a half. Okay. Okay. No, I didn't. I I completely brain farted on that, but but uh, I have to give that one a try because I do like sixty ring gauge cigars, quite a bit. Yeah, give it a try. You're gonna love that one. Yep. No, I'm sure I will. So I'm going with the Quadrata, um, and I'm smoking the Toro size in that. Um, I think Enrique, you kind of nailed it. This has more spice. It, you definitely, but it's not a spice that's gonna overpower the blend. And while it has a nice finish, again, the spice is not going to overpower the finish on this thing as well. Um, it's a box press, which is it's your box press line. Uh, great draw on this box press, by the way. Uh, not too airy, which is what I really like. It's got just like it's it's in a very sweet spot there. Uh, there's some nice sweet notes I get. I'm getting some of the woody notes and some of the earthy notes as well. Um, yeah, ex excellent cigar. Um Combustion is just perfect on this on this box press here. So um, mm -hmm. enjoying it immensely as well. And you said right now this is in three sides. This one you have in three sides is correct. Yeah, three sizes. That's uh, Robusto, Torpedo, and uh, Toro Bravo. Okay. Yep. Okay. So I was Excellent. smoking this at in. Huh? Yep. I described it a little bit earlier. This is actually a different uh, size. It's a, I was talking uh, to Will about it before we got into the show. It's a uh, Lancero size. Uh, basically, we had, uh, I had a friend that, that was saying that he, he liked Lanceros and he loved the Serena blend. And after a couple of drinks, I promised him that I made him, I'd make him this size. So next day I woke up and I tried to keep my promises. So I came back to the Dominican Republic to the factory and had uh, a couple hundred of these cigars made. Send them a couple, and I've been uh, smoking them. And uh, I'll be sure to send you guys a couple so you can give it a try. It's a beautiful brand. It concentrates a little bit more on the Lancero size, as we were talking about. It's a mild to medium cigar. It's got great character to it, nice creamy smoke, just all-around cigar. Can you yep, show the band to the, to the camera yep. real quick? Yeah, Croc, I, Croc wants to see it, and I saw that too. So I really dig the color, and especially the contrast with the, the color of the wrapper. How, was there a, a little bit of playing with how, how you guys came up with the, that color for that one? Yeah, basically what we try to do, as I said, the, uh, the brand's the same. The what changes within the brands are the secondary band that has their, uh, their line. So mm -hmm. the secondary band has Matilde, Serena, Matilde Oscura, Matilde Cuadrata, or Matilde Renacer. And uh, what we try to do with the bands or the colors of uh, our box is usually they're pastel colors. So they're a little bit uh, more shut with, and we want them to uh, do contrast with the wrapper. When we were working with uh, the Matilde Serena, what was happening is that the Connecticut is already kind of uh, off a uh, wrapper. It's not as shiny as the other cigars, I'd say. So instead of going with a pastel blue, we uh, went with this aqua blue, which uh, played uh, very well, as you were saying. It plays very well with the gold, plays very well with the wrapper, and it just stands out. The idea is basically having the color of the uh, band stand out with the color of the wrapper. So we'll bring out the wrapper and bring out the band at the same time. Right. Yeah, I mean, you've done that exceptional with all the lines. The other one I'll point out that really contrasts well is that pastel green with the with that dark wrapper. It just, I mean, you go in a humidor, you know that's your cigar. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, that's the idea. It's being found. Yep. Yep. So that's and you'll not... see it with the same boxes. I mean, they're all the same boxes. You got the green box, blue box, the brown box, which is natural color box, and your orange box. Yep. So every ring has the same color box. So it's a very simple uh, packaging. I think it's very elegant, and uh, it just makes the brand uh, stand out a little bit more. Yeah. Agree. Agree. So that was what we are smoking. Be sure. Like I said, check What's your, out the... So your, your favorite brand at the moment is the Oscura still, or what's your go-to when you're talking about Matilda? It's still the Oscura. Um, still the Oscura? But I really, the Quadrata has kind of in the last few months, I don't know what it is, I'm going to the Quadrata a lot. 
Okay. So you like um, your medium plus body cigars, yeah. so different like, yeah. profiles. Yeah. Yeah. The Quadra I've been going back to a lot. Yeah. And I think it's I think it's also we you know, we talk about aging as I think Renaissance and Quadrata especially have really aged well. Oh yeah. Not That's to awesome. say the other ones haven't, but those two have been exceptional on the aging, which is something I look at too. Yeah, I remember last year we were like uh, uh, Renacer Robusto was a number three cigar of your top eight cigars, I believe. Uh, it was the no, it was the Oscura. The Oscura? It was the Oscura. But I'm not talking about the top cigars. I'm talking about the eight cigars. Oh yes, yes, correct. The eight cigar list. Yeah, I actually discontinued the eight cigar list last this year. That's why I kind of drew a blank. But yes, it was. Um, and I want to get into that at Lancero because there's, there's, there was a story. When we get into wedding cigars, I'm going to tell that story, too. Because uh -huh. that in particular plays into that story, correct? Good stories. I like stories. Yep, yep. So For, yeah, for that me, that's very story, that, yeah. that story is really special. That was my number two cigar of the year last year. It was. It's oh, just, beautiful. it's, I don't know, man. There's something really good about that cigar. I appreciate it, man. I appreciate yeah. it. I was like, hey, keep, yeah. keep smoking and we'll keep making them, my friend. Mm-hmm. Looking forward to the Lancero, though, for sure. Uh, it'll get him. It'll get him. <laughs> you could have a lot of people asking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So what we'll do, uh, we'll take a quick sponsor break, and then we'll actually talk about this, these couple of these wedding story cigars that we have. And um, we'll talk about um, Jerry Tobacco. The authentic Corojo leaf is one of the most robust and flavorful leaves out there. During the golden age of cigars in Cuba, it was a leaf of choice to make some of the world's greatest cigars. Because it was one of the most challenging ones to cultivate, it fell out of favor by the 1990s. In the Hamastran Valley in Honduras, Julio Aroa took on the challenge of growing Corojo from the original seeds. And in 2000, he reintroduced authentic Corojo back into the market. With over 50 years' experience in the tobacco business, from growing and curing tobacco to cigar production, the Oroa Tobacco Farm has been able to continue to deliver products to market with authentic Corojo. Now with Jerry Tobacco, Julio and his son Justo bring their very own brand to market, each containing the authentic Corojo leaf. Tadascan offers a mild to medium cigar in both a Connecticut and Abano wrapper. Rancho Luna is a premium medium cigar available in Abano and Maduro. And Aladino is a 100% authentic Corojo Puro representing the golden age of cigars from 1947 to 1961. Now available at your local retailer, be sure to ask for Jerry Tobacco, a legacy that is tasted in every drawer. And by Cornelius and Anthony, if you want to be wanted for something, be wanted for something great. That's what Cornelius Bailey set out to do five generations ago, and that's what Stephen Bailey is doing with Cornelius and Anthony cigars. Using the finest tobaccos, Cornelius and Anthony brings to you the Daddy Mac, the Venganza, Meridian, Cornelius, and the recently released Ariel and Senor S. Cigars. You can find them at your local tobacconist. Hey, you can really roll your R's, eh? Go I'm through. learning. I'm learning. Yeah. I'm glad someone Go noticed finally. I was told I have to roll my R's from someone. So. Yeah, you say Corojo, Corojo. Corojo. Good. That's a, yeah, there you go. Yeah, I had that to correct it Abano and say Abano. So I was, that's the one I'm working on now. So. <laughs> hey, you, you, perfect, you, you perfect one and you keep on going with the others, right? Exactly. One step at a time. Yeah, I mean, you should have started away when we had our old show. We were terrible with the pronunciation. We've come a long way. <laughs> I'll just say that. So, all right. Will Cooper and Aaron Loomis here, joined by Enrique Sass. We're going to get into our Debonair Ideal segment, sponsored by Debonair House, makers of Debonair and Indian Moses Cycle Ultra Premium Cigars. And tonight's topic is wedding cigars. So, I'll kind of just I'll kick this off, right? Because my daughter got married two years ago. And Enrique, you're getting married on November 18th. That's correct. That's My correct. daughter got married November 13th, two years ago. Yeah, um, and you said she's still happily married, so I guess people that get married in November are happily married all, all forever. Yeah, it's a good Whatever, sign. Yep. Yep. And married good people. So, yeah. So, exactly. that, you know, and I'll get into a little because there was a wedding cigar I, I gave out, and I, I, folks may have heard that story. I'll get into that in a little bit because I made a couple of mistakes with that, actually. Um, but, you know, so here's what was the Renaissance Lancero, okay? I had smoked that, okay? And when I went to, when, we, when, we, when my daughter got married, she got married in South Carolina, about 90 miles away from where we live. And we basically, for the week, spent the week in South Carolina at a hotel because uh, kind of, you know, we're parents of the bride, blah, blah, blah. My wife was needed to be down there. So we stayed at a hotel, and basically I had to get out of the way. It was really my job, right? 
And I had taken some of the Lanceros down there with me. And there was the there was one morning where again I had to just disappear. Or I think maybe that day I actually disappeared on my own. Like I kind of <laughs> and I took that Lancero with me. Uh one of those Lanceros. I went out on the patio. It was a perfect November day in South Carolina. I smoked that thing and I had smoked the Lancero and I'm like, wow, that thing. And that was one I had. I had bought several of those Lanceros. I didn't buy a box of 40, but I bought quite a bit of them. And I was like, man, that cigar just, it made that day for me. I just remember smoking it um, that day, the Lancero. And, and it was, I said, this thing re again, responded extremely well to age. Um, so I, I should mention that one as when I mentioned the other two blends, you're right. I, I forgot that blend, but that is part of the whole story as well. That was really good. And, and I, I did an age cigar list that year and it was on there. So, um, that was kind of, you know, set the tone for a good week is what I'll say. That's beautiful. I, I'm glad, yep. uh, I said, could, uh, yep. help out this, that good tone. Yep. And I'm glad you enjoyed it. It's a very, yep. definitely a very special cigar for our, for yep. our family. Especially as I got later into the week, I was smoking just not – it got a little more stressful as the week went on. So um, it got a little more difficult. But, yeah, um, it was that first morning after we got down to South Carolina I had it. And it was – the day was just perfect to have it. And then yeah, people started – gathering. Yeah. People started gathering around me too. Um, and I wasn't giving them any of the Lanceros though. So it was kind <laughs> of fun. I, I wouldn't um, – but yeah, so that was that was. Don't give them out. Yeah, no, that was mine because I, you had told me they weren't there. coming back at that point. So exactly. So yeah, <laughs> I've been asked a couple of times they were coming back. I'm like, nope, sorry, it was just limited release. Yep. And uh, we're keeping it like that. So yeah, you so you are getting married, um, and and being a cigar maker, um, you are going to have cigars. Yes, we will and have cigars. You, you kind of mentioned a little in the last segment about this particular cigar. So what were you thinking in terms of what you were looking to deliver, I guess, at this wedding? Well, you know, it's the, I mean, coming from, uh, as I was talking about, I worked a little bit with with the travel retail. I mean, and I also did a lot of well, the wedding cigars. We used to do personalized wedding cigars at the, this company. And, uh, Frankly, in a wedding, what you should uh, be giving out would be your mild to medium cigars because you don't know who's smoking, who's not smoking, and you want you everybody to enjoy the oil. cigar, right? You don't want somebody to, you know. And, and that was part uh, – you'll see that was part of the problem I ended up with. Yeah, but uh, – yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, as a cigar guy, what what, uh, what we're doing is I'm going to be creating a small uh, souvenir box. So the cigars are going to be part of the souvenir. We're going to be making a limited uh, – production of about 250 boxes and what these uh, boxes are going to have are is a robusto and the serena size which is your everyday and for everybody cigar and then we're going to have this other cigar which is what i was talking about it's basically a cigar we came across with a playing like with different wrappers it was the oscura blend with a brazilian wrapper and it just gives it a Different profile, less earthy, more sweetness to it, uh, a little bit stronger, but just a beautiful cigar. And uh, once we came, uh, once we tried it, I liked it so much. We never released it because, as you know, Aaron knows, and if you know, people don't know, FDA uh, regulations uh, won't let us uh, release anything before August 2016. But uh, but I've been smoking it, and I decided so the cigar I like so much, I was going to offer it in, uh, in the wedding. So it's going to be a regular production cigar, which is our Serena, which is usually what I would offer in any wedding. As a cigar smoker, I want to have other cigars, so we're going to do that. What we will do differently is that the Serena and that other cigar are going to have a different band. And what we did was, if you see our, uh, our band... It has the Matilda logo, and it says Matilda and Matilda on both sides. My bride's called Gabriela, and there's the S for Seja, so it's going to be Gabriela and then the S and Matilde in a different color just to commemorate uh, our wedding day. And then the secondary band is setting, instead of having the line extensions, it's going to have 1118, which is uh, 1811, sorry, which is our wedding date, November 18th. So basically, they're going to be great cigars in a nice, beautiful cigar box as a souvenir. Beautiful. And the, the color on that band? 
Oh, yeah. Oh, I feel like I have it. Let me show you the picture. Bear with me. Okay. Oh, actually, it's just right there. So that's it right there. It's a wedding cigar, folks. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but I nice. so it's kind of a red, uh, a red pastel color, mm -hmm. which turned out beautifully. So very excited with that. So we're gonna have a couple of cigars made. We're making, uh, obviously, making a little bit more to for safekeep or for smoking afterwards. Which, knowing myself, I'd be smoking all of them before the year ends. But you know, they're meant to be smoked, not to be kept. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what was your story with the wedding cigars? So long story short is when, when, when your daughter's getting married, um, you know, yeah, the, the family is, you know, the bride family obviously is the one that's, you know, doing a lot, but, but I stayed out of the way completely because that was my job, right? Just write checks. And, you know, that, that's, that's, you know, basically nod. And, that's all fine. I'd have Smile and nod and give your checkbook out. But <laughs> it came down to, it, there were going to be cigars at this wedding, okay? Um, and so long story short is I was, uh, Phil Zengi uh, ended up, ha uh, I ended up getting cigars from Phil Zengi's Debonair Maduros, okay? Now, at the time, I had basically s was thinking, okay, I have all these people who are not going to be going to the wedding who are my friends because there were enough people that my daughter knew that and her husband knew that. You know, I, we just couldn't do it, right? It was just going to be out. Of, it was going to be out of control if we had all my friends in. So I had these cigars made up, and the Debonair Maduro is a full cigar. Okay, it's it's, and it, I smoke them, and they're great. Except I'm smoking these. I'm like, and I end up giving them to the people who didn't go to the wedding. These things are way too strong, right? <laughs> this is this is so, and they had custom bands. Like they took Phil asked for a picture of my uh, an engagement photo of them, and did they did a nice band for them? They did a great job on it, right? And there were no there were no you didn't have the uh, Serena's out there because that would have been perfect. So, but I knew I said there's no way, right? I can this ain't gonna this ain't gonna go, right? Um, but I took them to the wedding anyway. But I ended up taking an assortment of different cigars, um, you know, Romeo and Julietas, you know, Monte Cristos, I, you know, you know, basic stuff that I felt you know people would like. Um, but it was really interesting because everyone still wanted to smoke the wedding cigar, mm -hmm. and I, I said, "How do you like it? I like it a lot." Uh, like too strong for you? Nah. I'm like, I'm turn, what are you talking and I, about? And I'm seeing them turn, and I'm seeing them turn green. Okay, <laughs> so it was kind of fun. But so I was like, you know, if it's too strong, you know, so everyone was still going for those cigars anyway. Um, now the other catch was, we found out there was no smoking on the patio, right? So I'm like, oh crap, right? So my my daughter felt very bad on that. I said, don't worry about it. You know, it, she got married at a botanical garden. Well, I had the cigars anyway inside. Well, um, everyone took the cigars and went outside and started smoking. So my son comes in, Timothy, my oldest son. He's the one who works at the cigar shop. He's like, Dad, they're all smoking. I'm like, oh, crap, I'm dead, right? <laughs> so I go out. Yeah, I, talk to the I talk to the bartender. He's like, look, it was this was a Friday night wedding. He's like, you guys are fine. Don't worry about it. Um, so we were lucky because we had about 30, pe 40 people smoking out there at one point. So. Yeah. Thank God he had a good bartender. You might get in trouble if it. Yeah, well, he like got that, tipped. Right? Believe me, he got a nice tip. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, Don't worry yeah. about it. It's okay. <laughs> so Everything's moral, be so good. Moral, yeah, the moral to the story is follow Enrique's lead, not mine. But yeah. like I said the cigars were great. No, it's something you you experience. Uh, I wouldn't have experienced other weddings. I'd be giving out a stronger yeah. cigar. Yep. And you always have to give a mild to medium cigar in a wedding. And the uh, rule of thumb is that if you have a wedding, you usually take half of the cigars. So a half of the people are going to take cigars and smoke them. So let's say if you have 100 people who take 50 cigars, if it's 400 people who take 200 cigars, 150 cigars, and that's usually how it goes. That's a uh, rule of thumb with the wedding cigars. And my wife's like looking at me like you have – you have like a humidor. You have humidors you're bringing in. What are you doing? She's like, I said, you got to have variety. You got to have options. You know, <laughs> like, this is a way to run out of a cigar shop. <laughs> you can't run out of cigar. Seriously, you can't run out of cigars. I mean, that was yeah, yeah. so. I was, you know, I was, and then, and then the um, the wedding party they got uh, Davidoff Nicaraguas so they, in the tubes. So they were the 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 groomsmen got those, and 
they just most of those guys hadn't smoked a cigar that good. Most of them had smoked, like I said, if anything, machine made. Um, and they were blown because they never had a premium cigar. And it was just watching those guys have their eyes open. The premium cigars was was great. So you, I'm sure you converted a few cigar smokers that day. Yeah, you made it. But they were asking me about the Lancero day. smoking, and I'm like, yeah, you can't have that. <laughs> like, not why? That. I said, right. well, they're mine. <laughs> yeah. So oh, mine, mine. Yeah. yeah. Aaron, you, nah, you, but uh, yeah, go ahead. Aaron, you got, sorry. It's, it's funny that you were saying that your only job was uh, with the cigars. That I was. That's been my only job in the in the wedding. I have to make that's sure the cigars. Just, just that's literally job. my only job. Everyone's like, don't screw up the cigars, and uh, hopefully I won't. I'm still working on it. <laughs> no, no, I'm sure you you guys won't have that problem either. Yeah, I'm sure I won't. Now, Aaron, you, Aaron, how about you? Well, you, yeah, because you're. I don't want to say you're not recently married, but you you didn't get married that long ago, did you? Yeah, I got married in 2012, so five years. Um, so five years. So what, were you doing cigars back then? Yeah, I was smoking cigars back then, but I didn't I didn't bring cigars to the wedding. Um, what? <laughs> the, the way that we the way that we had it set up was we only had a limited amount of time that we had for the location, so we had like a four hour window. So you, know, you got the ceremony, and then you have after that you have the the meal, and then after that you have the dancing and all the other stuff and the speeches and the cake. So um, I just wasn't going to have enough time away to be able to, you know, enjoy a cigar or anything like that. A bunch of my buddies, um, they got to go out and smoke and things like that. But I was, you know, I was as part of all the festivities. So I just, I didn't get to partake in that. And that was True. okay. I mean. Yeah, it, my, my it, son-in-law went through the same thing. You're right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's one day. It's a special day. You know, be with your bride, all that kind of stuff. So if, if she's okay with it, then that's a different story. But if it's like you really want to focus on on your your special day, then that was just going to be the way it was. I mean, the night the night before, um, me and all my buddies went out. You know, we were smoking cigars and drinking and all that stuff. So we had we had our kind of day the day before. So that was fine. But I mean, I know lots of people that you know kind of do, do the same thing you guys are doing. Is you know they they bring cigars, um, they get special bands made, or sometimes they'll have a you know a roller that comes to the 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 wedding and kind of. Uh, you know, slaps a, a wrapper on the cigars, um, you know, for the people there to, to smoke. So, you know, there's, there's no, nothing wrong with that. Um, I would just say for anybody that's thinking about having cigars at their, at their wedding, talk to your soon to be wife first, because that's not the first fight that you want to have is that you're trying to smoke when you're supposed to be hanging out with her. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's a, I that's think, a fair point. I think yeah. it, what I've heard that your job in the wedding as a groom is just, Smile and nod, dance, take, and do take pictures. Take good pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, actually, I didn't get as much chance to smoke as you would think, right? Like, my wife was really worried about me being out smoking and just abandoning the wedding. I knew I couldn't do that as far as the bride. I pretty much had to, you know, shake hands, kiss babies, that type of thing. You know, so I had a walk. So I didn't really, I got a chance to smoke in the last hour, probably that night just because i couldn't do that and it, by then so many people went out to the patio it made sense for me to go out there and start smoking yeah, yeah. you were still shaking hands while you were smoking right yeah it was there, an excuse there was, there was a guy who lit up a piece of cedar on his cigar that was classic <laughs> right and, and it was he, he lights up and it was a a cedra kind of woody well, yeah it was yeah. A, and, I, and i said to him i said hey have you, you're have you smoked before right i see what he's doing he's like oh yeah i'm like oh great I right, enjoy it he lights up the cedar <laughs> I just let yeah, him I, I, I just this all the time. time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. My daughter's yeah. gonna be three this month, so I got a ways away, but uh definitely plan now. If she chooses to get married at the wedding, uh I'll be able to partake in cigars then. So that'll be nice. good. That's hey, let me know. Let me know. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. I know a guy. That's yeah. good. That's good. <laughs> so that was our discussion on wedding cigars. Uh and I uh, hope we wish Enrique the best as far as that goes. So we're going to move on to our deliberation segment. And this is sponsored by Dumbarton Tobacco and Trust. With Dumbarton Tobacco and Trust, Master Blender Steve Saka set out to create Puro Sum Compromiso, Cigars Without Compromise. This represents an expression of Saka's closely held values and attests in three simple words, everything Saka wanted to accomplish. Cigars are more than a passion for Saka, they are a way of life. As for the brands of Dumbarton Tobacco and Trust, Sober Mesa, Mi Carita, Umbagog, Muestra de Saca, and a recently released Todos Los Dias at your local tobacconist. 
and by M. Bombay Cigars. M. Bombay Cigars represent the most admired cigar culture in Cuba. They select the best of the best quality tobacco to use in the aging process. M. Bombay Cigars are then rolled in Costa Rica by some of the most experienced cigar rollers, giving it a unique cigar experience. The band portrays the detailed and artistic nature of our small industry. Try the M. Bombay and the new Gaia line. M. Bombay Cigars, where the cigar is a way of life. And by MLB Cigar Ventures, fueled by his passion in the cigar industry, Mike Bellotti has realized in order to bring the best premium cigars to market, he has had to collaborate with the best minds in the cigar industry. With MLB Cigar Ventures, Mike teams up with Ernesto Perez Carrillo Jr. to bring you the David P. Ellert line of cigars, and Manuel Manolo Casada to bring you Imperia, Imperia Islero, and the new Imperia Aventador. The cigars of MLB Cigar Ventures, developed by legends and smoked by connoisseurs. And I saw Mike... Mike Bellity has his yacht, I think, somewhere in Palm Beach this week. So, you know, <laughs> so he's wandering around Palm Beach right now. So definitely uh, check out Mike. Uh, go to his yacht. You know, he'll take you out there. Yeah, that's a, that's a great fucking guy right there, my friend. He is. Yeah, he is. Uh, he really is. And I know uh, you guys are all part of that Casada family as well. Yeah, so you are. We're part of the same family. Yep, yeah, exactly. So we're going to get into our deliberation segment. And Aaron, I, I pulled an audible here right before the show, mm-hmm. by the way. Um and I'm adding a second question. Um, so what I want to do is there's, there's there was some news this week, right? And I, I want to just kind of get a little opinion on this. I have a little opinion on too. So earlier this week, it was announced that there was a motion for a preliminary injunction uh, as a part of the lawsuit that the trade associations have filed against the FDA. And in particular, that injunction, the scope of it covers really two areas warning labels and user fees Mm -hmm. it doesn't cover the pre-market approval process and i think that's because i think it's being re the fda has kind of agreed to reopen the door on that so to some extent but user fees and 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 warning labels are very much right now regulations that are coming in the upcoming months so their user fees are already in progress Mm -hmm. so there was an injunction basically filed to to stop those, uh, to stop that, as well as um, the warning labels, which Rick and I were also talking before the show. There's no rhyme or reason to how they're doing these rotating warning labels. The words used were arbitrary and capricious. So the thing is, that, so this this motion for injunction was filed. Here's what I, I noticed. I've been, you know, I do a lot of the FDA stuff on my site, right? And I, and I get people talk to me about it, right? This almost was like, and I had people for months telling me, when are we filing an injunction against the FDA? When's this, why, why don't we file an injunction that basically stop this until it goes to court, right? Mm-hmm. The injunction is filed this week, and it was almost like I didn't hear a lot from many people in the cigar industry or the consumers. Right. So my question is, why is that? That I don't know. Um, I'm not sure if they might have been uh, kind of as surprised as – some of us were that it just came out. They weren't maybe as in tune with what was going to go down. Um, I'm not really sure what, what the reason for the, for the low volume on it is. It, I kind of get it because I get, I notice people who are frustrated because in the industry, obviously they've submitted these warning label plans mm-hmm. and they paid user fees. Right. I get that. Right. But to me, this was a, a and whether this, whether this injunction happens, I don't know. But look, if 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 this if the injunction is filed and puts a halt to it, and then this goes to court, and they win, there's going to be money coming back. I would assume to the cigar industry on this. So I don't think it's a. I I would be. I'm just real surprised. I've just heard nothing from our audience or even you know the cigar. It's been very quiet th- this week. Yeah. And something I really, I, I guess I just didn't put two and two together in regards to the the warnings is that in regards to cigarettes, the, the warnings that are on the cigarette packs aren't required by the FDA. It's by the Surgeon General. So the fact that it's being pushed for the cigar side by the FDA seems like kind of a big deal now. And then maybe that's kind of what some of the push was. So is that the case? Is, is that the case? Or I thought it was just that they they had an issue with surgeon general. So it's it's something that actually comes from the surgeon general. Yeah, it's a, it's a surgeon general warning. It's not a an FDA imposed thing or anything like that on, on the cigarettes. So, um, you know, the fact that it's, I mean, I think most of us would kind of agree that 
you know, uh, a cigarette is much more harmful to your health than a cigar is just based on the way you consume it and the ingredients. Um, so that, that kind of just jumped out at me when I, I don't, I don't remember where I saw it. Somebody mentioned it, but, um, it just, that kind of jumped out at me as, as odd and kind of a, an unfair, uh, attack on the cigar side. So I, I, I do know CRA and, and IPC, they've been pretty quiet on this and a football post asked me about that, but I think they have to be quiet. Unfortunately, they're, they're the ones issuing the litigation here. So right. at that part, I understand, but I guess, I guess still, I, I saw this as something very positive right now. Uh, and it's, and it's also showing me the industry serious about fighting these two things. Mm-hmm. Um, why it, like then one thing I was talking, cause I was trying to gauge a few people on this day. One people said, well, it took a long time. I don't understand the legality process in terms of why it took so long to, to do this. So that's the part I don't get, but right. they still did it. Yeah. So if you're a cigar consumer out there and you're listening to the show, I'd like to know, are you, are you fired up about this or, you know, are you complacent about, it? I don't think you, I think it's something that's, I think it's a positive that happened right now in our industry. Mm-hmm. I agree with that. Yep. And so, any of, these, any of these steps that they're taking, it seems like, you know, there was there was such a delay in, you know, taking action, but it seems like they're actually they've actually been doing a lot of good work and starting to make a lot of strides lately. So that's 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 a positive at least. You know, they are. I mean, and we've heard the argument that maybe they were behind the eight ball mm-hmm. when the you know quote more maybe you know the argument is I've heard two sides of the argument. They should have had a few plans in place before uh, May fifth last year. Yeah. And I've heard the other argument saying, well, we didn't know what the plans could be until we knew what came out on May 5th. Right, right. Um, and, you know, I get, so I, that, there's, there's, I get, I get there's two sides of that. So, um, but yeah, like I said, something actually has happened. I mean, this yeah. is, it's a, I think it's a significant, I still feel the lawsuit may, I, my original prediction was the lawsuit may not happen now. Mm-hmm. Was what was, was originally it was, I assumed it wouldn't happen. And I was thinking more from the pre-market thing, but these other things could be a very different story here. Right. So, yeah. I mean, if you're a retailer, you should be extremely happy. Yeah. Um, like I said, if, and if these user fees are thrown out, right, which, you know, again, there's the big argument with the user fees, which I thought was interesting was that apparently the user fees aren't getting assessed on e-cigarettes it, and it's, it's basically the cigar industry is funding this thing right now. Yeah. And, and the pipe industry. I don't want to forget about pipe industry. They're getting hit right. with that. So, you know, they're, that's the argument why they're asking for an injunction and then they're asking for this to eventually be just thrown out. Yeah. Um, and if it's not, if it's if those things don't happen, then it's going to go to a, a, a an actual full court uh, trial. Yeah. And uh, the invite, I think, just came out today from uh, IPCPR for the um, – kind of the FDA requirements for the retailers that they're going to be doing a webinar on next uh, two weeks, I think from yep. now on Thursday. Yep, so, I saw that as well. Um, I've already signed up for that. I, I, I try to attend all those webinars just to kind of, you know, s- stay in the loop with what, you know, their, the information that they're putting out, especially for the retailers, because I've been, you know, very critical in the retailers in regards to their responses to, to all the yeah. FDA. Thing. So I, I have two, and if you're a retailer and you are, um, but I believe they put these on on demand afterwards. Yeah, every retailer should be signed up for that. Uh, so yeah, because there can be lots of things in regard to uh, different warnings that they have to post up in the shop and what's going to be necessary on the boxes and yeah. any other advertisements and things like that. So, you know, when we I think we talked a few shows back about kind of what was going to be the first. Uh, you know, who who or what was going to be the first uh, thing popped for uh, you know doing something against the FDA regulations. And I, I feel it's going to be a retailer doing something, you know, not not posting something up or something like that. So if they can, hopefully they are, they, you know, they are, all are aware of what they need to do and they do it in a timely fashion. Agree, agree, yeah. I've been kind of having that same criticism because retailers, you're going to be a subject to regulations as much as brand owners like Enrique is. So very okay. important. Um, and I and I bet and we when we had Charlie on a few weeks ago, you remember what Charlie was talking about? He, when we asked him the question of who's going to get the first violation, he didn't hesitate. He said it's going to be a retailer. They're going to hit yeah. a retailer first. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of retailers out there that I, I think are completely in the dark and 
some I, I would say the majority of that is their fault because they're they're not staying up to speed on what they need to do to for their business. Um, but it may also kind of lay on uh, IPCPR a little bit in regards to their communication with the members. Yep. Agree. Agree. So that was our first question. And we started talking about IPCPR. And this was the main question I had for tonight. Is Mark Purcell is going to be stepping down as the CEO of right. IPCPR? And apparently there's a transition process, but that's going to conclude sometime this month. I think it's the 15th. And they're going to be there's a search committee that's going to be put in place for a new CEO of IPCPR. Mm -hmm. Um, before and we'll get into a few things of where I think that's where I where I would like for that to head. Um, I think there were a couple of things why this happened. I think ultimately, though, it came down to I heard his contract was up, mm -hmm. and obviously. It, from all, from everything I'm reading, the, he, they didn't renew it. I mean, that's I'm inferring that um, there was nothing official said on that, but there was a decision. Maybe it was mutual that they were going to part ways. Now, if I had a look at the record of Mark Purcell, he was brought in. He came from the home builders industry as the CEO. He was a he was an expert on trade shows, and from I think he did some interesting things for the IPCBR trade show. But I think ultimately under his reign, there was this perception that the trade show uh, was diminishing attendance, mm -hmm. you know, and I think they looked at that and he didn't have them. Like, he wasn't a big legislative guy. Right. And I think ultimately they looked at that and they said, we got to make a change. Yeah. Like any CEO, they looked at the record was what it came down to. Not if you're a nice guy or anything like that or doing anything in of it. What's the bottom line? Yeah, I'm not, I mean, I think that the the continuing decline in the trade show attendance, I, I don't know that that, unless something major had happened, I don't see how that would have really gone any other direction, regardless of who was the CEO. I just think that was kind of a natural progression of how things were moving in regards to the format that they were using. Um, but what, you know, what happened this year with the uh, changing of the dates and the location, that was kind of a, a little bit of a punch in the gut, regardless of who would have been there. Nobody, you know, nobody was going to be able to to make that any different but well one can argue that he, he you know he did a lot of he, the builders trade show is one of the biggest ones in vegas right and he had connections that maybe if he wasn't there who, that could have been a worse situation we don't we don't that, know that. that's possible too yeah, yeah we don't know that um yeah. we again when we talked to charlie we're not really sure what happened there either you know right. there's a lot of stories floating around about that but yeah. obviously there was a change made yeah um so so mark's so mark is out Right. Uh, and now there's a search committee. And I think the big question you look at with the search committee is who do they bring in to take this job? Can they get anyone to take this job? It's even a good question. Right. And I think they have to look at two things. I think they have to look at, obviously, the trade show component mm -hmm. and the retail. And I think they have to look at the legislative piece. Right. So if you're, you know, if, if you're on the search committee, right. what are you looking for? I think I'd le be leaning more towards um, someone that can focus on the trade show, um, because you know, if you have the CEO super involved in the legislative piece, it's going to really consume all, if not most, of their time, and the trade show really needs some addressing to it. Uh, otherwise, it's going to continue to fizzle out. Mm -hmm. um, so I think focusing more on the trade show side is would be the the way I would lean. But do you need a CEO to do that? Um, they have some maybe, pretty good staff yeah, there I who's mean, done a good job with the trade show. Yeah, team. but I mean, you know, not knowing the, kind of the internal discussions, you know, was were there great ideas that the staff had that they couldn't pursue with Purcell? Um, you know, was he the one that kind of you know making those ultimate decisions of what they were going to do, what they weren't going to do? That's that. Those are things I'm not privy to, so I'm not sure if that's the case or not. I go back to 2014. Um, so 2013, Bill Spahn uh, resigns as CEO, and they, they go on a long search for a CEO. Mm -hmm. They don't name that CEO. It ended up being Mark. They name him in June of 2014, like right on the eve of the trade show. So pretty much that 2014 trade show was done without 
without him. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so, I mean, I think it was a pretty good show. I mean, 2014, I'm not saying it couldn't have been better. Um, I look at it this way. I think if they're, if they need to make ground on the legislative end, I guess I'm looking at it from the legislative end. Sure. Um, I'm looking for someone with the legislative experience, right? Right. And I'm like, well, where do you, where do we go for that, right? And boy, I picked the wrong week to say this, right? <laughs> and, you know, I think you know where I'm going with this. The first, the first place I would look is I'd look at the NRA, right? Right. And, and look, you're not going to get Wing Lapierre or his lieutenant, mm-hmm. but it, is there someone that you can get at a at a middle level in there who may be wanting to have an opportunity to be a CEO? Right. I'm going to go further. I Normally, when I look at, like, head coaches and managers in baseball, I always want the experienced guy. Right. I'm not interested in grooming a guy. Yeah. However, and normally I'd say this here, I think in this case, can they find a young guy, a dynamic guy, maybe from the NRA, who can come in. I don't know if such a person exists. I tried to look and see if I could find such a person in the NRA. Mm-hmm. Ideally, that's what I'd like to see. But I would like to see someone in there because obviously the NRA's had a lot of success in lobbying and things like that. And can they pluck someone in as a CEO role and then maybe hire a I know it's I know they there's limited money. So I don't like I said they're not gonna be able they may not be able to afford certain people in the NRA, but is there mm-hmm. someone they can't afford? And can you hire another person to do the trade show end of things? Right. That's yeah, that's a possibility. So that's kind of where I'm, and, I, and that's where. Or if you're not going to go to NRA, look at someone who's been in a regulated industry who has trade shows. Um, I mean, the spirits industry would be one. I mean, even we had Brian Mussard from the cattle industry, which has their their own thing. I don't. I'm not saying Brian would be the guy for that, but. There, there may be someone in that organization that, uh, that can do. So that's where I'm, but I think I really want to see a young guy in there. I, I mm-hmm. really want to see a young dynamic guy. Um, maybe you can keep him there. He wants to get a CEO credentials at like age 35 or whatever. And maybe at some point it's a grow. I realize it may be a growing opportunity where he may get, if he does a great job, he's going to get plucked somewhere else. But that's where I would look for that. Yeah. I mean, I think the struggles would be, you know, you, you're coming, you're, you're behind the eight ball right away. I mean, you're, you're you got a hole to dig out of. You know, you're in an industry that's really struggling to to fight that regulation. So it, it may be what you say. You know, somebody that wants to try to make a name for themselves, someone that's young, they want to you know get that title on their resume and things like that. Um, I mean, and and if they did a really great job, you know, I'm sure that would be a you know good boost for them uh, as right. well. Um, right. But you know you. I don't know what the funding is for it and things like that, but you know, you're, you're going sure to have to come down to funding a lot, but I'm, yeah, I'm to attract somebody like that. It's going to be, it's going to be tough. I, I I agree. I agree. But I think it's also a critical, they're on a critical juncture too, mm-hmm. that uh, look, I'm not saying Mark did a bad or good job, but I, I mean, if you're going to bring in another guy, uh, if you're gonna bring in another Mark, it's mm-hmm. not the answer either, because obviously right. they were unhappy with something that he did. And I, I don't, believe in just changing the face without changing the credentials yeah so they have to do something is what i think yep definitely definitely and i think they got to move faster i don't think they can afford to wait nine months this time because the legislative wheels are as as slow as washington is moves they're moving faster than you think you know the lawsuit starts in january you know so i i Part of me is like they're going to be going. I don't know, you know, IPCPR has been a critical part of that lawsuit. Yeah. So I would think you want to have some. Le- I mean, right now you have the board, but the board are retailers. They're yeah. not. They're not. This is not their forte. So I'm not saying the board are bad guys, but you know, they. But have I mean, to- the or- the organization is supposed to be focused on the retailers. I mean, that's really what the the whole function of the but organization is. They are. They are, but they signed this. They obviously signed up for a lawsuit, and this ain't going to be cheap either. Yeah. Now, you know, and I know they have to look at funding for for that as well. I guess I still, like I said, it still surprised me they made this move despite everything. Yeah. Um. So that that was my feeling on that. Anybody from the cigar industry that you think would be a good fit? And I know this would be tough because, you know, it's going to be a, it's a full time job. So yeah, you know, if somebody that's already in the cigar industry, they'd have to 
they'd have to step away from what they're doing now, which I don't, I don't know that anybody's interested in doing that. But if I mean, it just kind of doing speculation and things like that. Is there anybody that's currently in the cigar industry that you think would be might be a good fit and be able to kind of bring that kind of push push along? It's interesting because you know I, the, there's one name everyone's going to think about, but he's not going to take the job. It's Rocky. Mm -hmm. Um, but he's not going. That's not. I don't even see that as an option. He's not. You know, he's. He, he can't that's a full-time job so i think they have to look for someone in the cigar industry who maybe is not an owner but but someone who's a senior person in the industry that could um that could take that job right um good question you actually stumped me on that a, a name i thought of was um dave garofalo from two guys um he's he's pretty involved in the on the legislative side of things, um, he's been to Washington a few times, and he, he's very involved in the New Hampshire stuff. Um, I wasn't you know, thinking got, retail, but yeah, he, yeah, he would I mean, be. he's got stores that he's you know got to take care of. So I don't know that he would want to step away from that. But he, you know, he's a guy that's very uh, very vocal. Um, he's open to trying different things. Um, so I, I, you know, just kind of thinking in someone internal that's a retailer even. Since it's that's so the retail organization, organization focused. Yeah. yeah, it's you know that would that would be somebody that you know interests me. You know, it intrigues me. I guess would be the right word to say. Yeah, I mean, the other person I could think of, you know, Jeff Borsch, which would fall into that category. He he was already on the CRA end of things, right? But uh, you know, I don't think I don't see him. He's with his farm and his Davidoff store. I just don't see that happening. He, right. he would be a fit for that, certainly. He could do that job. He can go in and do, he can walk in tomorrow and do that job. If they haven't hired anybody by November, we can just ask him. Yeah, we'll, we'll ask him if he's, <laughs> he's a candidate for the job. He's on the November night show, by the way. So, uh, um, yeah. So, um, yeah, we'll ask him on that as well. Um, you know, I don't think uh, I here, I could see one scenario happening. Okay, mm -hmm. and I'm this. I'm not going to mention. I'm not going to throw a name out, but. If there is a retailer that sells his stores, right, and there's a few retailers that are, there's a lot of buzz of certain retailers wanting to sell and get out, um, then I can see maybe he's hired back by the IPCPR to run things. Sure, that would be the the scenario I could see it happening. Um, I, nor nor I don't think again I don't think Jeff and Dave are selling so I don't right. think there's anything with I think if they did it they'd have to obviously leave their their shows the stores there yeah 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 um so that would that would be interesting there yeah. very interesting so I think like I said I think they have to move quicker on this like I said it's we're already getting into the last part of the year mm -hmm. um and I, I just think they need to, they cannot wait till June again to right. do this I, I think it would be a disaster uh, i mean i'm sure the board will do a good job navigating the waters the next few months mm -hmm. um, and i think they have some good people on their staff who will work to put a very good trade show together right um but they have some challenges they have to address as well. i mean there's the other there's a charlie Minato scenario we were talking about where if cra and ipc have emerged sure maybe maybe you bring in maybe you bring in a ceo um and then have one person do legislative one person do trade show yeah um as well so maybe you look at a scenario like that i don't see glenn loop being the ceo though i would see him running i would see him reporting into a ceo sure i, don't, I just don't think that's his forte i think right. you know if you gave him vp of uh legislative i i could see that but i, I don't see him uh i just don't see him do, doing the C. and that's yeah you know, i just don't see him for that role i don't see right. his strengths there yep i agree so, with that so they could bring in more of an administrator with that and then have delegated to two key people. Mm -hmm. Sure. So very interesting. Very interesting. So we shall see what happens. Um, yep. So we got, uh, anyway, um, just kind of wrapping up before we kind of uh, close out with Enrique. Um, Aaron, what's happening on developing pallets? Uh, we got a contest going on, uh, giving away some uh, big poppy cigars. Uh, there's uh, two prizes. One is a, a full box, and the other one is a five-pack with a lighter. Um, so head over to the site, uh, find out how you can enter. Uh, it's a fun contest around the baseball playoffs, so it um, gives you a chance to represent your team on social media, which a lot of people do anyway. So might as well tie that into winning some free cigars. And we have Ram Rodriguez from uh, El Artista, makers of that yep. cigar, on the show 
November 16th, mm-hmm. um, which actually is one of my eldest son's birthdays. Yeah. <laughs> and he turns 18. And he turns 18. My son Peter turns 18 that night. So nice. it's a big night. Yeah. So uh, I may have to give him a cigar that night. So, uh, <laughs> yep. So uh, as far as what that's coming, um, I have a couple of reviews in the queue for next week. Uh, CAO Anaconda, Winston Churchill, Late Hour, and The Ariel are all coming up by Cornelius and Anthony. Nice. Um, show-wise, um, we, we are pretty full. Um, the next, next week, we have two shows we're doing. We have um, on Tuesday, Bear and I are doing uh, a special edition on a variety of topics. It's called Winds of Change. Uh, it was a show we were going to do this Tuesday, but Phil Zengi ended up doing the show. So uh, we moved that out. Um, to We're going to have a, a little talk, too, on um, we'll hit a little of that Cigar Dave uh, controversy, too, mm-hmm. that happened uh, with the media guys. We'll hit a little of that. And then uh, Thursday, we have Chris Topper of Topper Cigars. Uh, I have a package that just went out to you today, so you'll have some of his cigars as well. And... Um, the following week, we have uh, Juan Martinez of um, Hoya de Nicaragua on the 19th. And on the 26th, Fabian Ziegler of Drew Estate. So mm-hmm. a full month, full month of shows yeah. for sure. Um, anyway, uh, Enrique, uh, first of all, thank you so much for uh, doing the show. Um, Thanks for having certainly me, don't be a strang- Yeah, Certainly don't be a stranger. Um, I mean, we'll have you back for sure. And uh, where, are you heading anywhere before the wedding, or are you just going to be kind of uh, s- staying in the DR till then? I'm kind of grinded, grounded, not grinded, grounded up until the wedding. Then after that, I'm going to be uh, going up in December, uh, amazingly enough, to uh, the New York area and New Hampshire and Connecticut area. It's going to be pretty cold, but uh, yeah, we're going to be there uh, doing a couple of events and doing a small tour over there with uh, Brett Power Socks, our broker over there. Good for you. Uh, he's a good guy, Brett. Yeah, Brett's a good guy. Brett's an awesome guy. Yep, yep. So uh, some good shops up there um, as well. So uh, New Hampshire's a great uh, cigar state, so to speak. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, so we look forward to that as well. And definitely uh, we'll follow you on social media leading up to the wedding. Mm-hmm. Yep. yep, definitely. Yep. But uh, anyway, that wraps up uh, episode 24 of the Primetime Show um can't believe we're already 24 episodes in but thank you uh, aaron thank you everybody to our audience and we'll see everyone next tuesday take care